This is Bounty, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. Well, I was selling them pretty cheap. That's probably why I went out of business. It was more or less just a hobby for me. I wasn't out to get rich. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Wes Newell was founder of Newell Industries, a company that produced a number of popular hardware upgrades for the Atari 8-bit computers. Its products included FastChip, which sped up floating point routines by 300%, OmniView, which provided 80-column text output, Ramrod, which provided memory upgrades and enhanced ROMs, and Omnimon, a hardware monitor. Wes was also author of Pro Bowling, which was published by Atari Program Exchange. This interview took place on June 9, 2016. After our interview, Wes sent me his collection of Newell Industries paper, documentation for every product that they released, and a large collection of printed source code for Atari 8-bit and ST products. He has generously placed all of the Newell Industries material in the public domain. I've digitized all of it. You can now find it at the Internet Archive. See the links in the show notes at ataripodcast.com. I was working at Rockwell International as a project engineer. We had uh, some computers there, some AIM-65, some old, uh, had some, what was that other one, Commodore PET. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I got interested in personal computers. Before that, back in the, I guess it was the mid-70s, I installed the first computerized branch exchange in Texas well, for a uh, private branch exchange in Texas that was computerized that I had to talk to. I had to load with an old teletype machine and uh, eventually got a terminal for it, but it was just, couldn't do much with it, but it was there. I guess that's why I got interested in the computer thing. Nice. So, how did you um, find the Atari machine? Well, in uh, about 1979, I guess it was, I started looking for a personal computer just to play around with. And I looked at the Apple, which I thought was junk. I probably shouldn't say that, but I still think it's junk. But anyway, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> The TI, what was it, 99.4 or something like that, Mm -hmm. which had good specs, but it didn't really have much support. And uh, the Atari just seemed to be a cheap, popular machine. It did color. It had separate uh, uh, video processor, where like your old Apple II or Apple I or whatever it was, Everything just ran off to 6502. It had poor block graphics. It just wasn't very appealing to me. So I decided to go out and buy me an Atari, what was it, a 400, I think it was. That was uh, either in 79 or early 80. I don't remember the exact year. And then once uh, once I got it and I started... uh, Playing around with it, you know, wanted I wanted to do a little programming. So I'm not a programmer by profession, but it's not that hard to learn. So, and then I wanted to do some modifications to it. Like I, my original 400 only had one slot for for RAM, and I made a little bit where I plugged into that and adapted it to where it would take three gram cards. And uh, I don't know, just played around with it for a while. Hmm. Then I met with, uh, joined the Atari user group here in Dallas. Um, met a guy there, a really sharp programmer named Charles Marshlett. Uh, and he, was, he wasn't he was happy with the uh, floating point routines that was in the uh, uh, Atari. It was in a ROM based, so he redid it and did an excellent job of, of doing that. Uh, that's probably a little later. But anyway, the, the, the games, the early games, I just peddled with it and wrote some junk. Mm-hmm. But the, uh, the Fast Chip, which was my first the first product I sold, Charles Marsh had actually wrote the code for it, and I had the ROMs manufactured. 
So what was um, your 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 background at Rockwell? I mean, you seemed like you knew a lot about hardware hacking and things. What what were you doing there? I was a project engineer for the ACD automatic call distribution system, which was uh, 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 based on a PDP. I can't even remember the numbers. One of the early PDP mm -hmm. processors. Mm -hmm. but, you know, it was a computer based, another computer based system. Yeah. This other gentleman came up with the the faster floating point. And so you created the fast chip. It was that at that point you decided you created a, a company, New World Industries, in order to sell this stuff? I can't remember if that's when I went down and got out the name or not, but it probably was. Then after that, I just started doing more things with it. I got with a guy. Uh, there was a hole in the operating system board that wasn't being utilized, a 4K hole. And uh, I got disinterested with the operating system, with the advanced graphics and uh, the disk operating system. I, I modified it to where it would take long file names to that 83 garbage. Uh, just mm -hmm. not a whole bunch of different things. Right. That that was an article in uh, Antic Magazine that you published. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Nice. So it sounds like you spent a, a lot of your uh, your personal time hacking on the the Atari. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did. So it it was there a point where it st it changed from hobby to business? Did you? Was New World Industries uh, always a sideline, or did you quit your job? Yeah, I eventually quit my job, but that didn't really have anything to do with the Atari thing. It just <laughs> me and management didn't get along. So then, New World Industries became your main gig for a while. Yeah, it, uh, I did it for I don't know into the. Early 90s, I guess it was. You know, I, mm -hmm. I stayed with the Atari line, you know, the 800XL. I did memory upgrades for it and a whole bunch of other stuff. I modified the operating system. Uh, what else? I don't know. Just, just a lot of garbage. Yeah. A lot of stuff. <laughs> So I'm curious on, I'm not an extremely technical hardware person, so I'm curious like how you went about creating a memory upgrade. I mean, you're looking around the hardware and how do you go, oh, well, this thing has 32K in it, but I can make a megabyte fit in this. <laughs> how, how did you, I don't know, ex explain well, it. Well, uh, how did I go about it? Uh... I, somebody had created a crude 30, I think it was a 32K memory upgrade that, that I'd worked in 32K chunks or something other like that. That didn't really work very well. I said, well, that's, that's not really the way to go about it. So I just went about it a different way and created it. And I think it was, God, I can't even remember, 4K blocks now to where it would bank out. And also because the Atari system had the dual processor with the Antic chip in it, uh, all of those early upgrades, they didn't do anything to handle the banking of it. And so I, I, I kind of ran into how to do it by accident, but once I figured out how to do that, then it could use, it could run the program that the other memory upgrades wouldn't run. You know, because it supported antic banking also. Mm -hmm. But that's how I basically got into the uh, uh, into the memory upgrades on the old uh, 8-bit machines. And I think uh, at, in the end, the uh, last one I did would support up to 4 megabytes, if I'm not mistaken. It's a lot of memory for that little machine. <laughs> yeah, I never put 4 in it. I was never... Most I ever put in it was one. Did, did you get people who spent through down the money for that those huge you know megabyte four megabyte upgrades? They, that must have been super expensive at the time. Well, 
know, I was selling them pretty cheap. I don't remember what it was. That's probably why I went out of business. But I sold them pretty cheap. It was more or less just a hobby for me. I wasn't out to get rich. Mm-hmm. Money has never been a real big issue with me. All right, so let's go down the list of your products, and uh, you can tell me about memories, how they're created, just any stories you, you want. We already talked about the fast chip a little bit. Um, there was the the OmniView series, which uh, gave 80 columns. Okay, OmniView was not done by me. That was done by a guy named uh, uh, Charles David. Had us. I said, no, I, yeah, he caught me at a real... Oh, I'm getting a little old and my memory's not as good as it used to be. But what was David's last name? Anyway, I'll probably come up with it in a minute. But uh, but he actually did the Omniview. And uh, he did it because I created, or uh, I started selling the, uh, you know, the OS board for the old 800, 400, 800, that would take that extra 4K block of memory that was just a hole in, with their board. He did the OmniMind and OmniView. Was it Charles David Sears? No. All right. Gosh dang. So, it's all right. It'll come to us. Um, so... I'm trying to find an old product. Well, I see that I have listed my products. I should have known to get that out earlier, but try to find it, but I can't find it now. But anyway. All right, so the uh, Omni, uh, the Omni view was the the eighty column stuff. So did yeah, how did you find yeah. this guy? I mean, did he did he approach you, or did you know him from users group? Nah, he was a, he was a member of the Atari user group. His name was David Young. I don't know why I couldn't remember that. Charles David Young. He went by David, though. Great. And uh, I, and he also, you said, did the Omnimon? Yeah, he did the Omnimon and the Omniview. I think, so my assumption, just based on, I don't know, reading things, is that Omnimon was maybe your most popular product. You think that's true? Um, no, probably not. Uh, it was pop. It was a popular one, but not, of course they couldn't run it without the the uh, operating system board. Mm-hmm. Uh, you you couldn't run the Omnimon in a stock computer, so they had to have the uh, I, I think I call it the Ramrod board. Right. So was that was the it, Ramrod the most popular product? Uh, probably the probably the fast chip was. Hmm. Yeah, that very first one. It was probably the most popular one because it really sped the computer up quite a bit. Yeah. So the was the Omnimon used? Who used it? Was it was it legitimate programmers or was it all hackers trying to crack software? I don't know what they use it for. I mean, it had some good features. It, it was mostly for for doing. It was kind of like a mini assembler. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I don't know what people use it for. I didn't use it a lot myself, but uh, other people liked it same day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the OmniView, of course, was used for people that want to do word processing. Like, it worked okay with, uh, I'm trying to remember some of the names of those old word processors. The letter perfect comes to mind. And that's about it. Mm-hmm. Got to remember this been 30 years ago. Right, no, absolutely. <laughs> it's been a while. Uh, let's see, and there was the OSNXL. OS chip? Yeah, well, there was the, the, the original one was the OSN. That's when I redid the operating system 
for the original 400-800. And, uh, what did I do? On on that train, I included after the, uh, uh, 800XL came out, or I don't know if it was a precursor to that, that added the extra graphics modes that were in the antic. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted those in the old machine, and it didn't have them, so I rewrote the uh, operating system to include the extra graphics modes that you got in the 800XL series, wow. along with along with some other modifications like the the. Uh, you now, back when I first got this thing, I used everybody used a cassette recorder to load their programs. And it was limited to, I can't remember what the baud rate was at this time, but anyway, I, include, I included a deal in, that, in the new one where you could boost the baud rate up about four times faster. I can't remember the exact details of it, but it could go quite a bit faster. And uh, that helped a lot for uh, cutting your program loading and saving time, you know, by 20, by 75 percent. Wow. So, that seems like a huge project to reverse engineer the operating system and then rewrite it in a way that didn't uh, irritate Atari's lawyers. Yeah, they never never seem to be too concerned with anything. We actually approached them uh, with the fast ship software because it was so much faster than the other ones and that's the reason they rejected it they said because it was too fast yeah. in other words people that wrote software that relied on for next loops for timing mm-hmm. I mean it would just throw their timing all off because it was so much faster and so they rejected it for that reason because it was too fast <laughs> kind of stupid. It's kind of stupid, but you know how upper management is. They're not real pride anyway. <laughs> yeah, it seems like short, not, not very forward thinking. Um, hmm. Wow. But um, that that sold for you know for the four hundred eight hundred crowd, and then God, I can't remember what we did for the. Uh, I know there had to be a version for the 8XL series and XE series that may have used the same one. I really don't remember. Hmm. I should have grabbed my product list before I, before you called, but I got busy with other things. I get it. I'm looking at a, at a list here of products. I don't know if it's complete or not. It was just something that Antic Magazine published at some point. Um, so, yeah, they, there was the 256K... XLLM RAM upgrade, and then the Ramrod and the Ramrod XL, and yeah. also MyDOS. Tell me about MyDOS. MyDOS, Charles Marslet did it. I mean, I, I sold it to, you know, for him, uh, but Charles Marslet did the MyDOS. Um, okay. I don't know what to tell you about it. God, it's been so long though, since I used it. It just had some advanced features that the other one didn't have. It would do. It would use the memory upgrades to the uh, the banking of the memory to where it would utilize it, where the original DOS wouldn't do that. Uh, there's not much to say about that. You ought to get a hold of Charles to, to talk about it, probably. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be good. Um. Charles Marsley was the, uh, he was a professional programmer. Hmm. He worked on, uh, mostly I think it was on 68,000 stuff, but back then he was doing, uh, he eventually went to work for one of the video card manufacturers. Then so long ago, I can't remember which one it is. He lives up in the Seattle area now, if he's still alive. I'll try to find him. Um... All right, so so what happened next? You're coming up with these 8-bit products, and it seems like you started to make the transition to the ST side of things. You had a published a small business manager inventory invoice program. 
He actually did that among the original one was for the uh, for the eight bit of toy because there really wasn't any, yeah there really wasn't anything out there mm-hmm. uh, you know inventory control point the cell program that I could find for you know for the earlier computers so I just wrote my own. I also wrote some software for Rockwell and I just gave it to them. <laughs> and did uh, we used to have to do. Um, I can't remember what you call it now. Just data data entry at Rockwell to get our cross connects for our computers for our uh, ACD system. And they were we had to do punch cards, take it to take it to engineering. Uh, it took like three or four days to just to get a, a, a cross connect list by t- running it through the way they did it. Well, I wrote a program on the little Atari, and I think at the time I did it on the Atari 400 to where it would do it all, and I, rather than having to do punch cards, I just entered the data into it, and it would print out more data than I'd get back from the mainframe at, at, at Rockwell, and I could do it in about two hours, where it took four days to do them. Wow. And everybody there was wanting me to do theirs, and I said, yeah, give me a day off, and I'll do it for you. I go home and do it in two hours and have the rest of the day off. <laughs> <laughs> nice. but, but yeah, I got into writing the software. That, that pro bowling game that was just garbage. I mean, that was just something I came up with. It was the one I was the one that Atari sold to uh, uh, was it Atari Exchange or whatever. Yeah, the Atari it was Program called. Exchange, right? So let's talk about yeah. that. You, so you wrote this bowling, this bowling game, which I think you originally published yourself from New Old Industries, and then you sold through APX. Did, how did it sell? I didn't sell. Through them, it didn't sell very good. And uh, of course, theirs was written totally in basic. When the when I did, I actually did that one first, the one I the one that they put in the program exchange, and then. Uh, the one, the one that I sold, I rewrote a lot of the code and put it in the same language. Hmm. It was you know, totally different, much faster, much smoother, and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But it was just a game. It wasn't much of a game. <laughs> <laughs> I found it, a few- it, 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 yeah, it's not, it wasn't real, real graphic-oriented. I played the APX version this morning, and... Uh- it didn't hold the interest. <laughs> no, no, it's just something I messed around with. I actually, I actually did it just for the fun of it when I first did it. <laughs> I wasn't intending to, mm-hmm. to sell it at all. I found a few other little right. games by you. Um, a, a five card stud and a lunar lander game and something called Space Shooter 2. Oh, that stuff, I. That's stuff I did real early within the probably first few months of when I had the computer. Nice. So, should we talk about how the uh, the company came to an end? What you what happened? Well, yeah. When uh, I mean, Atari pretty much you know went under, wasn't selling much, uh, and at that point. Uh, you know, I tried to stay with them. When the IBM PC came out, it pretty much wiped them out, even though it was a piece of junk, but <laughs> that's beside the point. Uh, and so I had, to, I had to eat, so I had to go back to my what I was doing before, which was telecommunications. Right. And you, you sold the, all the... IP rights to uh, fine-tuned engineering, is that right? Uh, I didn't, I'm, you know, it's been a long time ago. I think all I did was give them the rights to use it. I don't think I actually sold the rights to it. Hmm. I, know, I know I just found something online the other night that I, that I had sold the company to them, but, but I didn't. Really? I think I'll, I think I'll have to go through the paperwork if I can find it. But I think all I did was give them the rights to to sell it. Hmm. If 
if you can find the paperwork, um, I know the Atari community would be very interested in seeing it because the general belief is that you sold the right. Anyway, just to, so we can know for sure whether it's it's you or, or them or kind of what happens. So um, it doesn't matter. I mean, I, I don't I don't care who did it. I mean, it, to me, it's all water under the bridge. Yeah. He could been the part Matter of fact, I published the. Uh, the schematics for pretty much everything I did. I think I put it in the public domain. I know I'm saying I'm pretty sure. I, pretty sure somebody out there has it. Not that they want it, they can come get it. Yeah. Well, I don't care. <laughs> what What do you What do you have that uh, maybe is not out there yet? Do you Do you have schematics? Do you have source code? Do you have anything that you can share that uh, we can scan and archive? Well, I've got the source code for all my operating systems and most of my software. I mean, but to be honest, I just look at it as a dead horse. <laughs> you know, it's pretty much in the past. There's not, a, there's not a long future for software in these days. No, that's true. But there is a, a good-sized community of hobbyists now who would love to have access to that stuff so they can modify it or make new versions and things so would you be willing to uh lend it to me so i can scan it and wow if i them? can find if i can find it at, at one point i had all of it in uh, a digital uh in digital format where i have a, i had a uh website for a long time and I had posted it all up there. Um, if I can find it, I'm you know, I'm almost seventy now. I've been retired for since I was fifty six, so I just don't have time to mess with that junk anymore. I understand. Well I've you... turned into I've turned into a user rather than a an abuser. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um all right, so what haven't I asked you about those days that I should have? Uh, I don't I don't know. I mean they were they were good times, but uh all good times come to an end. What can I say? If you could send a message to the Atari users that still exist and you can right now, what would you tell them? I don't forget that old crap. <laughs> and jump, jump on something new. <laughs> Look to the future, not the past. Wow. All right. <laughs> Man. Um, I mean, I'm just being perfectly honest. I'm not much of a guy for old stuff or yeah. you know, going back in time. Sure. I get it. No, I understand. I understand. For some of us, it was a uh, a golden time of you know being kids and playing with amazing new technology, and uh, you know you you were part of it. You helped us uh, have more memory and hack software, and uh, so we appreciate that. Well, I was I was glad to help, and I'm into other stuff now, and I still try to help people with that. But uh, going back to the Atari, nah, that just too long ago. I get it. I got it. Well, uh, Wes, I think I have what I need. Thank you so very much. No problem. Thank you, sir. You bet. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org donate.